around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. We'd like to take the opportunity today to welcome each of you to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. We greet you in the risen name of Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. I want to encourage you today to continue to pray and seek the face of God. Our nation is in a place, a state of turmoil. It is always amazing to me how people can see the same identical event, read the same news, whatever the case might be, and have direct opposites in understanding, comprehension, or how they value it. But I've learned through the years, when the benchmark is the Word of God, that will always keep you looking correctly at the world. I was speaking to someone just the other day about 9-11, how that will be 23 years ago this coming September. 23 years ago. As a nation, the question is very simple. Have we become more godly or have we become more ungodly? Now, there was a reaction, not a response, but rather a reaction. A reaction is a scientific term. For every reaction, there's a reaction. It was a reactionary move on people's parts after watching 9-11. Churches filled up. God began to be extolled and lauded. But about six months afterwards, it deteriorated. Since then, the Supreme Court adjudicated the 14th Amendment, same-sex marriage. Abortion can still be had. Transgenderism is flourishing immeasurably. All the wrongs, all the evils are growing exponentially. This is why Jesus said to the disciples regarding the wheat and the tares, leave them alone, let them grow together. What you really have right now is an acceleration and the growth of the tares. It's almost as though the tares are taking over the wheat. And when I taught the wheat and the tares, I fell about two years ago. I, I may be off a little bit there. I spoke about how the roots of the tares intertwine, intermingle with the wheat so as to get their sustenance as well. Therefore, Jesus said, don't pull up the tares because you'll pull up good wheat when you try to do it. This has to be a spiritual application. You can see the deterioration. You can witness the departing from the faith. You can witness as people have all the time in the world for leisure and for pleasure but they have no time for God. Just like in the birth of Christ, there was no room for them at the end. Think of that. The Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah was born in a stable. A feeding trough was his bassinet, his crib. But he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. There was a Beautiful, glorious choir, the heavenly host saying, Glory to God, peace on earth, goodwill unto men. 
For unto you is born this day of the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. All of this took place. No pomp, no parade, a lowly lamb of God born in a stable, placed in a manger, feeding trough. People today have a skewed understanding of Christ. You've heard me mention it recently. The last several weeks, the Spirit of the Lord has dealt with me profusely about the second advent of Christ. This is not going to be some docile, tamed, meek, mild, and lowly return of Christ, but he's coming in power and glory. When Caiaphas was, was questioning Christ about his lordship, Jesus, in humility, said, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And then Caiaphas, the Bible says, he rent his clothes, saying, this man, Jesus, has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? But no, behold, now we have heard his blasphemy. All Jesus was doing was telling him the truth, yet it was deemed blasphemy. When Jesus comes, It'll be like anything mankind has ever seen, ever thought, ever could imagine. The whole cosmos, the vicissitudes, the earth, the, the, the brightness of the day, everything is going to change as he begins to make his glorious return. Zechariah tells us the daylight when he comes will be seven times the brightness of a normal day. Seven times. I can't imagine that. I do know the Bible says that Christ will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The illumination will be blinding. It'll be startling. It, 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 it's, it's immeasurable. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. We're getting ready to teach the 26th chapter of the book of Acts. And I have been studying, and Paul is, this is about the third time in the book of Acts, he's reiterating his testimony, his Damascus Road experience, and he talks about how the noonday sun was in its strength. And then that was followed by brightness that blinded him. I can personally relate to that. When I was a little boy, 12 years of age, Christ came to me. The light was so bright. It was, it, was, it was so blinding. I closed my eyes, had my hands over my eyes, and my face bowed down to the earth, the dirt. And it was still blinding me. And to think he didn't come at me or to me in wrath or anger and, or in vengeance. He just came to me to call me into the ministry. 
God is a very simple God when he needs to be. He's also a complex God when he needs to be. But in dealing with a 12-year-old little boy, he was very simplistic, telling me, I cannot take you to heaven yet. I have a work for you to do. Didn't even use the word ministry. Might have been too much for my uh, 12 years of age comprehension. What does that mean? I understood work because I was already working, making 50 cents an hour. I understood that. Our nation needs a move of God as never before. Regrettably, sadly, tragically, things aren't getting better, but rather they're, they're growing worse. No, I'm not on my soapbox, which I'm accused of sometimes. I'm trying to awaken you. I'm trying to stir you. I'm trying to remind you this is a very serious thing. Are you serious about your walk with God? Are you in earnest concerning your walk with God? Do you really pray? Do you really commune? Do you really fellowship with God? Or does God just get lip service from you? Or do you agonize and labor in prayer? Do you baptize your mind and your soul and spirit in the word of God on a regular basis? Or, or is it just, you know, like most people today, I'm a Christian. People go weeks. Never fellowship with God. Oh, they may ask God's blessing on the meal. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Blessed, amen. I call that courtesy prayer. We, we need intercessory prayer. There's a vast difference. And that's what it's going to take here in the end for there to be a move of God in this nation. As I've said and I'll say it again. If it was not for Acts 2.17, which says, and it shall come to pass, in the last day saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. If it were not for that verse and that great multitude in Revelation chapter 7 that came out of great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, I would question the gravity of a revival, not only in America, but around the world. Why do I say that? As it was in the days of Noah, as it were in the days of Lot. Do we see a revival in Noah's day or Lot's day? No, we don't. Noah was the preacher of righteousness. That, that's all the world had was Noah. Lot's day we have no record of anyone preaching the gospel. No one. Now, theologically, many people believe because of God's engagement, encounter with Abraham, Lot was a nephew, that Lot understood a lot of things regarding Elohim, God, covenant, etc. But we don't see one preacher preaching in the days of Lot which was after the Noahic flood. We don't see it. I'm not saying God's not going to send a revival, but I'm just trying to be as accurate as I can with the word of God. And I too am humanly flawed. I miss things. I misunderstand things. I misinterpret things. But Jesus said, as it were in the days of Lot, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man and as it were in the days of Noah. And Lot, his two daughters, Noah, his wife, his three sons, his three daughter-in-laws, eight souls were saved. Eight. The number eight, as you well know, means new beginning. It was a new beginning when Noah got off of the ark. We need a revival in America. I want to go today here to Psalms chapter 37. We may conclude today. Time will tell. Psalms chapter 37, verse 38. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be 
cut off. Throughout the scriptures, we witness as the wicked are represented, presented to us by tares that will be gathered and will be burned in the fire. They will be destroyed. Now, they will not be destroyed relative to soul and spirit because that is eternal. But their life as they know it in the earth will be destroyed. Matthew 13 and verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The end of this world. The word world would have been better interpreted age. So shall it be in the end of this age. Because as I've said, when Christ returns, the world will not end. It will be the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, the beginning of that. It will not be the end of the world. If the Lord came today, the world would continue to exist as it presently is for another 1,000 years. A thousand years, but the end of the wicked shall be cut off. They will come to their end. They will come to their demise. They will come to their ungodly, wicked rulership. Again, as I've said, all the stories and the Bible are synonymous if you have eyes to see, ears to hear, and can discern the accuracy, the closeness, and how synonymous these events are. John the Baptist, Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garner. I tell my Baptist friends, if you're going to be a Baptist, be a good one. Because John the Baptist preached the baptism in the Holy Ghost with fire. Same message Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. How can you say you are a Baptist, but you don't believe in the Holy Ghost and fire? It's because some man told you that's not real, that's not genuine, that's not for today. John said it's for today. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, for as many as the Lord our God shall save and as many as are afar off, people way out there in the future, this promise was for them as well. That's us. That's us. I've heard people say the Holy Ghost went out with the early church. Can you give me Bible for that? Can you give me one verse that authenticates, validates, verifies that statement? No, you can't. As a matter of fact, you can't even be saved without the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that baptizes you into the body of Christ and all these denials. And I know, listen, I'll be the first to tell you because it's, it's aggravated me to no end. You got all these prophets that are not prophets. They're wannabe. They're self appointed. They're self anointed. And they've prophesied so much false, false, false garbage. Absolutely, utterly false garbage. And they still have a platform. They still get the TV networks to carry them and to promote them. And they, they've told us lies. Hey, Jeremiah said, you're lying to the people, you false prophets. I know that bothers some people when I'm that pointed. Vain imaginations, vain visions. They ain't seen nothing. They ain't heard nothing because they ain't paid no price. Pardon my ain'ts today. Saying, 
Mike Pence is going to get two terms. When? He's, he's, he don't even exist anymore. I don't forget what people say. And what did Jesus tell us in the Mount Olivet Discourse? Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Many false prophets going to deceive many people. I do not want to be deceived. I don't believe you want to be deceived. I believe you want to hear the truth and you want to know the truth, period. But when John the Baptist preached the baptism in the Holy Ghost with fire, and then he talked about the chaff is going to be driven away by the wind, the fan that's in the hand of Christ, and the wheat is going to be gathered into the garner, the granary, the barn. That's the same analogy as the tares and the wheat in Matthew 13. John 15, verse 6, Jesus said, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Same analogy. Same analogy. You stay attached to Christ, you won't be cut off. He said, you abide in me. You stay attached to me. You get your sustenance. You get your strength. You get your eternal life through me. You stay attached to me. You have nothing to worry about. You become detached from me. You'll be cast forth as a branch. Anybody knows it's ever pruned trees? If you don't take up the branches the same day, walk out there a day or two later, and all the leaves have now withered, just like Jesus said, and is withered. And what do you do? Men gather them, and then we cast them into the fire, and we burn them. I've done that so many times. It's the process. Jesus said he's the true vine, speaks of himself. And if we, being the branches, are attached to him, we also bear the same fruit of his spirit. Vessels of honor. If we're not bearing fruit, we're pruned or cut off. And the angels will gather the branches that were pruned, cast them into eternal fire and damnation. These are analogies. But they are also literal in the sense of where people will spend eternity relative when they die, where, where, where will they go? Where will they go out into eternity? David says, the transgressors shall be destroyed. All wicked transgressors, people lost without God, are going to be destroyed, period. All the transgressors shall be destroyed together. Jesus will aggregate, he will collectively gather them all together and do away with them. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Once you're cut off in this point, you can't get back because it is the end. I was cut off. Why? I willfully left Christ as a young man and backslid and left God. God didn't leave me. I left him. I chose to leave him. I chose to forfeit the life of a Christian. Don't tell me you can't backslide. Don't tell me you're once saved, you're always saved, but you can smoke dope, drink liquor, and chase women, and you still got the goods. That's not factual. That's not true. That's heresy. That's fallacy. That is deception. And sadly, that garbage is preached today. What's the difference in a sinner committing adultery 
and a Christian committing adultery. There is no difference. They're both sinning. Sinners and sin does not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, people have believed so many lies. I'll get into this probably starting next week, God willing, on Acts chapter 26, how Paul the apostle was lucid in his right mind, yet he's murdering, killing Christians. Then when he gets converted, what does Festus say unto Paul after Paul's exhortation to King Agrippa? Festus says, you're mad. You're crazy. You're insane. And I thought, my, my, my. When he's killing Christians, hailing them, dragging them, persecuting them, slaughtering them, he's, not, he's in his right mind. But when he starts preaching Jesus, when he starts testifying, I too have become a Christian, he's insane. Is, is that not crazy? Boy, I, I, the, 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 the weeks I spent in studying the 26th chapter of Acts, I got under such conviction. Paul thought he was absolutely right trying to uproot, trying to destroy Christianity. He hated Jesus Christ. He hated the work of God. He hated the conversion. He did everything he could to destroy it. He was absolutely 100% wrong in his thinking and his theology. He was the hope of Israel because he was tutored, taught by Gamaliel, and Gamaliel was 35th in line from Mount Sinai to have received the law. And so Paul would have been the 36th. Harold, the great orator, the great man of God for the Pharisees. But God got a hold of him and changed his life. But think about, he thought he was right. He thought the Christians were deceived. He thought they were deluded. He thought they were delusional. He thought they were full of error. He thought Judaism was the final revelation of God Almighty, but it was not. And by the way, the New Testament sheds tremendous light and insight on the Old Testament. There's nothing about the New Testament that is in opposition or contrary to the Old Testament, nothing. All the prophets spoke of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Paul knew that. He read that. He studied that. He knew he would be like a lamb led to the slaughter. He, he knew all of these things. And, and, and I was dealt with heavily, dealt with by the Holy Spirit. You can be absolutely, totally, completely wrong and think you're absolutely right, but you're just as wrong as wrong can be. That, 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 that was a humbling teaching that I went through studying and preparing for this teaching in Acts chapter 26. Paul was guilty of so much that was wrong. Yet Jesus redeemed him, straightened him out, put him on the straight, the narrow path, and he began to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and that Jesus was the only way of salvation. And now they hate him. <clears throat> they hate Paul to no end. How many of us are wrong about a lot of things, but our pride, our ego gets in the way and we can't admit I'm wrong, I need to change? That was one of the most liberating things I ever did in 1994 when I stood before the church and said I was wrong. I was taught wrong, and I've taught you wrong, but I'm going to teach you the right way. Truth sets people free. Truth sets people free. And there's so much that is wrong today. 
And then when you try to share the word of God, just like the dear sister, I, I, I can't get over her. I gave her the scriptures in Joshua chapter 24 that Joshua said, our fathers, Terah, Abraham, Nacor, these men served other gods. And she flat out says, no, they didn't. No, he wasn't. Abraham was not an idol worshiper. Yet the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. Joshua 24, verse 2, I shared this. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. There it is. They served other gods. Abraham was as lost as anybody in this world. Elohim came and made covenant with him. We don't understand the choices that God makes. They're sovereign. They're right. They're not wrong. They're his will. And, 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 and you have people who say, well, the, the Jews have a special uh, connection with God. They don't have to go by the way of the cross. No, they have to go by the way of the cross. They have to be born again. Read the book of Ze Zechariah. Read it. I was reading that again this morning in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, where there's going to be a fountain opened up on the house of David. And it hit me. <laughs> that fountain is the Feast of Atonement in the fall of the year, which will be followed up by Feast of Tabernacles. That's why I said Jesus will come in the fall of the year. I don't know what year, but he's going to fulfill those feasts, and they're timely. They don't change. They're, they're fundamentally the same time every year. The only reason they change is because of the lunar calendar, the lunar cycle, and every 2.7 years, you have to add a leap month to the Jewish calendar called Viadar. We just had leap month back in February, February the 29th. An extra day is added. That's for the Gregorian calendar. I'm talking about the Hebrew calendar. So, as I said, some years, Resurrection Sunday will fall in March. Sometimes it's in April. Rosh Hashanah sometimes is in September, then in October. It's because of that 30-day calendar. But as I was rereading that again this morning, I thought, what better time than to have the Feast of Atonement when Jesus is about to come and Israel is shredded? being eviscerated, about nearly destroyed. And then God says, I'm going to open up the fountain of grace upon the house of David. Praise God. Praise God. It's all there in the scriptures if we can just see it and discern it. Verse 39, Psalms 37, verse 39, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Can I tell you, troublous times are coming. Troublous times are coming. I, I don't keep up with it, but I was told uh, a couple of weeks ago, Facebook went down. People couldn't get on Facebook. We've seen the, the three balloons, the first one that was shot, off the East Coast, another one in Colorado, Nevada, now another one in uh, Alaska. Then we had the cell phone debacle on a Wednesday morning. There are those who believe China is probing us, testing us. What does it do to us when they do this, when they do thus and thus? What does it do to us? How do we react? What happens? I even think somebody said TikTok went down. My point is, we're going to need the strength of God in the coming days. We're going to need the leadership of the Holy Ghost in the coming days. But the salvation, look it up, the word salvation there, but the salvation or but the deliverance of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength 
in the time of trouble. Salvation means deliverance, whether from sin or from trouble, adversity, whatever the case. God will deliver his people. We're going to need the help of God. We're going to need the hand of God. We're going to need the strength of God. Psalms 28, 8, the Lord is their strength. He is the saving strength of his anointed. God is our strength. Psalms 98, 1 and 2, his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory The Lord hath made known his salvation or his deliverance. He's going to openly manifest deliverance for you and I if we remain steadfast. Psalms 107 and 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. I love the Word of God. God will help us if we trust Him, if we look to Him, if we embrace Him, if we we lean upon His rod and lean upon His staff. This is this is the hour in the which we get closer to God. Psalms twenty-two, verse eleven. Be not Far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Who's going to help you in the day of trouble? Jesus. Jesus. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. David says, nobody can help me but you, Lord. You can help me. Psalms 29, 11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. God wants you to have peace. God wants you to have comfort. God wants you to have supernatural, Holy Ghost power and peace in your life. He wants you to have that. I love Psalms 41, verse 11. By this, I know that thou favorest me because mine enemy hath not triumphed over me. God will not let the enemy triumph over you. Psalms 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. God will be right there when the trouble comes, amen. Psalms 50, verse 15 says, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Oh, praise God. He said, you call on me when you're in trouble, I will deliver you, and when I deliver you, you magnify, you glorify, you extol, you laud my holy name, and let the world know it is I who has delivered you and kept you and preserved you in the day of trouble, amen. Psalms 55, 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. God won't allow you to be moved if you remain in him. The devil can't move God. I said the devil can't move God. The devil can move you. The devil can move me. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. When Jesus is in you, you are immovable. 1 John 4, 4. You have God little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is on my right hand. I shall not be moved. I will not be moved. You won't be moved either if you stay attached to the true vine and get your source of strength and sustenance from the Lord's Christ. He will help you. He will infuse you with the power, the grace, and the strength. Psalm 68, 35, the God of Israel is he that giveth strength unto his people. God is all about 
giving us strength so that we might live a godly and prosperous and overcoming life. God wills that we all overcome, amen. God wants every one of us to overcome. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. He gives us the strength, the enduring strength. Psalms 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. God wants you to have this power, this strength to overcome, to fight the good fight of faith, amen. To lay hold, seize eternal life, grasp it, take hold of it. Isaiah 40, 29, he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increaseth strength. If you're faint, he said, I'll give you strength. I'll give you power. I'll give you what you need to combat the forces of hell, the powers of darkness. And I love that verse in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in him, not in yourself. Paul said, be strong in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therein lies your strength, your power, praise God. It's not in yourself. That's why I gave you that verse a while ago, Psalms 28, 8. The Lord is their strength. He is the saving strength of his anointed. He is the saving strength. His strength and power and might saves people, amen. Saves us, saves us, not only our spirit, but from adversity, from destruction and chaos from the enemy. He saves us from that. You don't believe it? Study the plagues and the exodus. Israel was not raptured out. God just put a boundary line and said, you can't cross that line and touch Israel. I love it when it says, the darkness was so dark it could be felt. It was tangible. It could be physically felt. But in all the dwellings of Israel, there was light. Who but God can light a candle of the Holy Ghost and their homes, their cabins, their cottages, wherever that it might be, their tents. But everywhere else across the land, it was dark, utter darkness, darkness that could be felt, tangibly felt. That's, that's, that's gross darkness. We serve a big God. We serve a mighty God. The God we serve can do anything. And the more you pray, and the more you embrace the word of God and hide it in your heart, the more you understand, the more you believe that God can do anything. God has done so much for me in my life. He's given me so much, blessed me so much, delivered me from so much. I know I don't deserve it. I know I certainly am not worthy of anything of that nature or magnitude, but God, out of his great and vast love for us, Remember Romans 5 and 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You were lost in sin. Jesus still loved you. I think about Paul. He said as touching the law, he was a Pharisee. Now he wasn't a hypocrite. No, we oftentimes view Pharisees as hypocrites. We call people Pharisees, self-righteous. No, Paul was devout. Paul was devoted. Paul was committed. Paul believed with all of his heart what he was doing was absolutely right. <laughs> but he was absolutely wrong. And that's one of the phrases Paul makes there in Acts 26. He said, God helped me. 
meaning I have secured the help of God since I turned and started preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. I've secured. Uh, Acts 26, 22, having therefore obtained help of God. That word obtained there in the Greek says, I've secured the help of God. Correlates exactly with Psalms 28, 8. The Lord is their strength. He is the saving strength of his anointed. Now, Paul the apostle was the anointed of Christ. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. He became God's anointed. Thus, God was the saving strength of Paul. Saved him many times. All the shipwrecks, perils of countrymen, robbers, etc. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Immerse yourself in all the all the, the 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 trouble, the toil, the pain, the agony, the suffering that the man of God went through after his conversion. Second Corinthians eleven thirty. If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things or of the things which concern mine infirmities. He gloried in his infirmities. He gloried in his weaknesses. He gloried in his fragility. Why? He said, the Lord's right here. He's going to strengthen me. He's going to keep me. I don't worry about it. All the times the Jews sought to kill Paul, they couldn't kill him. Why? It wasn't his time. They didn't kill him. Rome killed him, beheaded him. But God never suffered him to die or, for that matter, uh, prematurely. You see, God has a will, and God has a plan for every one of us, and that plan will come to fruition as long as we abide in his word and his word abides in us. There's nothing the devil can do to negate that. He, He can try. He can try. These, these, these apostles after Pentecost were turning the world upside down. <laughs> they arrested Jason. He had to post bond. They said, these, these have come and turned the world upside down. That's the kind of revival America needs where our world is turned upside down. Let me go back here and finish up this verse 40. Psalms 37, verse 40. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Oh, that we might trust the Lord. Oh, that we would pursue the Lord. Psalms 118, verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Trust in the Lord, and the Lord shall help them, that's you and I, and deliver them, you and I. He shall deliver them, you and I, from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Who are you trusting in? Psalms 108, 12, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Give us help. God, give us help. I quoted it a moment ago. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. The Lord will deliver us from evil. He will deliver us from the wicked ones. He will save us from their snares and their traps and their evil plots. How is Christ able to do this? David said, because they trust in him. They trust in him. This is why obedience is so significant and so important in the life of the child of God, obedience. 
Samuel told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. You can fast till you are emaciated and you look like a Jew that had spent two years in Dachau, Treblinka, wherever, the camps. You can fast till you look like that. That does not touch God. That does not impress God. But when you obey God, oh, now that touches the heart of God. And you can obey God through fasting. He may call you to a fast, and you fast, and that's obedience. He blesses that. But I'm just saying, you, you, you can do all sorts of things in life. But if you don't obey Christ, if you don't obey Christ, you're not doing anything. I've learned to seek his will and that I might be obedient to him in every sense of the word. Obedience is such a key in the life of a child of God. Every one of you listening that has children, how joyful, elated, and prideful in the right way, I don't mean to be arrogant in it, but when your children are obedient, it makes you feel good. Jesus feels good when we obey him, when we make the sacrifice through obedience, whatever it might be. That blesses God, if I could use that term. Thus we bless his name for his faithfulness. We praise his name. We, we laud his name because he is so good to us. All of this is possible that David speaks of because we trust in him. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring forth. I mean, you hear about nuclear war all the time now. NATO's going to get involved. Michael Menahan. Air Force General, we'll be in war with Taiwan or we'll be in war with China over Taiwan. He said, I, my gut tells me 2025. I listened to Senator Turberville from Alabama the other day, a little news clip, and talking about how broke America is. He said, we're broke. It was a senatorial hearing. He said, we're broke. We're bankrupt. The lady testifying, she said when Social Security started out, it was never supposed to have been more than 2% of your income. Now it's pushing, I think, 13 or 14%. That's six, 700% increase. See, our government lies to us. Our government is so corrupt, so corrupt. And... All of this that they're allowing to happen in America is to destroy us. Our leaders, our leaders, God help them. And I'm sure a lot of them would tell you, oh, I'm a Christian. Yet you do things that you know are not honest. You know they're not forthright. They're not accurate. You play on words. Going to cut deficit spending. The first time I heard that, I thought, well, if you're spending a dollar and a nickel, you're going to cut it down a nickel to get it to a dollar. Well, you're not deficit spending. But that's not what they meant. Oh, we'll cut it from a dollar five to a dollar three, so we cut deficit spending. But you're still spending more than you're taking in. I realize that's, that's a lie. You see, to me, a layman hearing that rhetorical jargon, I think, well, that's great. They're going to go cut, go cut taxes, going to get us out of deficit spending where we're supposed to be only spending what we take in. But it wasn't true, folks. It wasn't true. I've come to understand sin makes people deceived and asinine. There are people that have great authority in America but they're as blind and deceived as never before. 
It's tragic, it's sad. But at the close of the day, all of this transpires and takes place because of a little three-letter word, S-I-N, sin, sin. Why is it like this, you may ask, sin? Why are the borders open, sin? Why deficit spending, sin? Why wars and rumors of wars, sin? Isn't it amazing when Jesus returns to planet Earth? For 1,000 years, there'll be no wars. Why? The Prince of Peace is here. Jesus himself will mitigate Every national dispute, if there is a national dispute, I don't know that there'll be any. They could be, I don't know. But over Pacific waters or Atlantic waters, a dispute, a national dispute with another nation, Jesus will take care of it. And you know what? <laughs> It'll be done right. There'll be no bartering. There'll be no... Uh, venal, graft, uh, embezzling, buying off. No, no, it'll, it'll be done righteous. That's all he's going to do is that which is right, amen. May the God of Abraham, my friend, watch over you every day. May he order your steps in his holy word in the coming days. May you fall in love with him more and more every day. May your heart and your affection be set on things above and not on the earth. May you look to him and may you trust him in the coming days to take care of you, your family, your loved ones, and your needs. He's a big God. He can do big things. I got an email the other day where I told a lady about a year ago, I said, we serve a big God, ask for big things. And she said, we just had one of the biggest doors ever open for our business. Don't be afraid to ask God for big things. He's a big God. And he has all power in heaven and in earth. God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much for your prayers and support for this ministry. I prayed for you this morning. Every giver, every need that you have, we bring them to the Lord and we pray he will intercede in your behalf. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great evening. Amen. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502 Kaiser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kaiser, North Carolina, 28020.